everyone and welcome to another episode of Faye and Tom's Divorce Coaching Podcast and as normal we've got another amazing guest with us and today we've got Paul Linsell who is a partner at the law firm called Boys Turner and I'm so excited today. Today we are talking about divorce myths and dispelling some of those myths really. You know when you have a divorce there's always lots of people giving advice, lots of myths that you read and today we're going to be talking about those, dissecting them and doing a little bit of busting with Paul's help. So, hi, Paul. It's really nice to have you with us. And would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, Faye. Hi, Tom. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Um, so, yes, so I'm a partner at Boys Turner in Reading in Thames Valley. I'm also a mediator, so I do a lot of mediation work as well. Um, I've been exclusively practicing in family law for longer than I care to remember, so over 10 years now. Um, but, yeah, looking forward to, to taking some questions and, and hopefully giving some truths rather than the myths and, and giving some good information. Cool. Uh, well, yeah, as space says, we are dispelling some divorce myths today. So this is, we're trying to give all the audience some, some real facts and some real insights from uh, the formal, legal, et cetera, perspective, not what you make Dave down the pub said or what someone told you at the school gates. So this is real information for all of our audience. So thanks for sharing with us today, Paul. Um, one of the first ones I've got, uh, which I want to kick off with is, what is, well, it's a double question, what is and who has parental responsibility? Okay, so parental responsibility, I suppose it's a legal concept, um, really. It's, uh, I suppose, everything that goes with being a parent um, and it's all the rights, obligations, duties um, that goes with, with being a parent. Uh, and really it's, uh, as I say, a legal concept now, there's been some sort of pains, I suppose, in, in the court process to say that although it's duties to, to the court, in effect, um, as a concept, those duties are really to the child. And it's making sure that the child is, is protected, is everything around them is, is what they need. So really, it's kind of everything around that. So the responsibility of, of being a parent, as, as obviously the concept suggests. In terms of how you get it or what is it and what does it mean in practice i suppose um generally speaking so mothers automatically get it as soon as a a child is born um, they will automatically have it fathers it's a little bit more complicated they don't necessarily automatically have it when a child is born um, it kind of depends so if, if they're married to the mother then they will automatically get it by virtue of being married if they're not married they don't necessarily have it um, just by virtue of the child being born, um, but they can acquire it. So if the birth is registered and they are registered as the father, then they will acquire it uh, in that way. If that's not, if that doesn't happen, there are certain steps that they can take um, to acquire it. In terms of what it means in practical terms, I suppose the, the reality is it gives access to dealing with things on behalf of the child. So if there's a dispute about the child, then you've got access to making court applications. Um, you've got a say in key decisions, so things like schooling or healthcare or taking the child overseas, things like that. So it's, it's a really important concept. And I think when I speak to clients, if there's any issues regarding children, it's always the starting point as a concept is to do you have it, obviously, is, is the key thing, and therefore, what does it mean to do? Yeah. You touched on a good point there about, obviously, with mothers, it's automatic. Um, with fathers, it's not unless they're married uh, or if they're on the birth certificate, uh, if they're unmarried. So just put in a little thread of unmarried fathers, because not everyone's married. Um, what rights does an unmarried father have? So it, it, it really depends, again, on that, on that concept of parental responsibility. So if they've got parental responsibility, the rights are effectively the same. It doesn't matter if you're if you're married or unmarried. Um, I suppose the the key distinction there is if you're unmarried when the child is born, you don't automatically gain those rights. You don't gain parental responsibility just by virtue of fathering a child um, and that child coming into the world. So you actually have to acquire it, uh, and sometimes that can be not as straightforward uh, as in some other circumstances. So as I say. If you're married, you automatically have it. If you're unmarried, you don't. Um, if you're unmarried, there are ways of resolving that um, and to sort that out. But I've dealt with clients where they're unmarried and perhaps the relationship breaks down before the child's even born um, or very early on when the child's born. And therefore, mother might be resistant. Um, so mother may be saying, actually, no, I'm not going to register you as the father on the birth certificate. 
Um, and I'm going to oppose you having potentially even um, parent responsibility. And that can become a bit trickier because you've then got to, to resolve that. In other circumstances, of course, there, there can also be questions about parentage um, and whether actually we need to be looking at testing um, and paternity testing to, to make sure that that is the father, um, whether it's from the father's perspective wanting to make sure or whether it's from the mother's perspective um, before parent responsibility then flows from that. So it's, it's put simply, it's more complicated, I suppose, for, for an unmarried father. Um, it's just a case they were getting that parent responsibility once it's been acquired, all of the rights, all of the responsibilities and duties and everything like that are exactly the same whether you're married or unmarried. I mean, on the back of that, Paul, you talked a little bit about mothers not having it. What would, ha would have to happen for a mother not to have parental responsibility? When you think about um, So a mother would, would always have it automatically by virtue of, of, of birthing the child. Um, so they would get it. Um, you can't get rid of it as such. Um, there are some extreme circumstances where parental responsibility is extinguished. For example, if a child's adopted and, and things like that, it then obviously goes to, to the adoptive parents. Um, but no, generally, yeah, I suppose to a, a sort of a standard situation, a mother and a father aren't married. Um, something that might crop up is that the mother then automatically gets those rights and tries to enforce those rights and the father hasn't yet got them. You then can have a bit of a dispute. Um, that needs to be resolved first before you can actually deal with the, the practical issues of what's happening with the child. So, so that kind of leads me on to my, and my next myth to, to dispel, um, because I've lived through this both as a child and as an adult. Do the kids always grow up with mum? That's one that comes up a lot. No, and I, I'm sure the two of you can probably comment on this as, as much as I can. I think the, the, the reality is that no, there's nothing in law that suggests children should be with their mother. Um, I think in terms of, uh, I suppose, the legal position is gender neutral. Um, so there's no sort of mothers are favoured or fathers are favoured in, in any particular area of the law. Um, I would suggest that society as a whole is still evolving. Uh, I think in terms of the bias perhaps towards mothers, um, in terms of the arrangements, I think that, eh, when you're dealing with judges in a court, um, the generation of most judges is probably a little bit older, um, and therefore that sort of societal change perhaps happens a little bit slower in the court sometimes. Um, but no, I mean, there is no nothing in law that says mother is preferred over a father or father is preferred over a mother. It's, it's very much the welfare of the child, what's going to be best for the individual child. Um, I suppose as I say, in, in society as a whole, that's still something that I think is evolving. I mean, if you think about taking it in a different direction, so paternity leave versus maternity leave, um, yeah. they are very different still. We are, fathers and mothers are still treated differently. And I think there is that sort of almost inherent bias um, in the thinking sometimes of people, both the parents themselves and the decision makers, uh, if there's a dispute. Um, but no, I, I don't think there's any any suggestion that children always end up living with their mum. I think the law now is very much more towards shared care. Um, I think that's evolved, particularly in the last five years, I would say that that's really at the forefront of, of most people's minds when a decision's being made is, is there any reason why it shouldn't be shared care? Because very often there won't be. Um, I suppose if you've got a very young child, um, so again, going back to what we were talking before about sort of newborn babies uh, i think the realities of that situation particularly if the mother's nursing the child and things like that then yeah the simple realities and practicalities of that are child is more likely to end up with mum for more time um, than dad but as a child grows older it will change um, but i'm sure the two of you have seen seen that as much as, as me i think when you get people speaking to you about what should happen with the children um presumably you get a similar sort of uh, take on that as well. Yeah, it's interesting you said actually about how that evolves over as the child gets older, because that's a, that's one myth I wasn't even thinking about until you just said it, that I actually deal with on a daily basis, is actually that the decisions that you, and arrangements that you make around the child's welfare and where they are, it's not set in stone. And as they grow older and as they become teenagers and things like that, they're going to start to choose where they want to be as well. So actually it's, that's one of the other myths, I think, for a lot of people is it's it's not cast iron clad it has to always be that way that it can evolve and be fluid and adapt to the needs and the suitability of the situation mm -hmm. and indeed the child stroke children 
Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the concept of parental responsibility as well, it's, um, it's not rigid. So the decisions that go with being a parent and the decisions and the powers, I suppose, that the parent has um, will change as the child gets older. Um, now, parental responsibility will flow until the child's 18. But it's very different when you've got, say, a four-year-old uh, and a 14-year-old even. Um, the, the decisions are, are very different. I mean, a classic one at the moment is the vaccination issues um, and the COVID vaccination. And there's a lot of debate and dispute over what's, who's going to make that final decision. Um, but actually, there's a concept known as Gillick competency, where children over a certain age, um, they make the decisions for themselves. And there's a presumption that they can make that medical decision, regardless of what parents say. So parental responsibility, as I say, it, it does sort of shift and evolve um, and change as well. So, and, and right, rightly it should, because obviously a, a child as they grow older should have their independence, they're a, they're a person, they should have their right to make their own choices. Yeah. Well, that's brilliant, Paul. I mean, the one that I'm thinking of, and growing up, I heard this a lot from, from people who maybe were going through divorces. And, you know, 15 years ago, when I went through my first divorce, it was always, I used to hear, if you don't pay child maintenance, you don't get to see your children. Is that a myth or is that a fact? Uh, that is an absolute myth. Um, it's a, a bugbearer of mine as well. I think, I think the, the legal system, both courts and outside of courts, um, particularly in mediation and things like that, very keen to make sure that the finances flow with what's appropriate to the arrangements for the children, um, not the other way around. Um, but even if you have a circumstance where a parent isn't paying, um, it doesn't mean that, that contact should be withheld. It doesn't mean that there shouldn't be time for the children to have a, a relationship with that parent. It's Frankly, they are two completely separate issues. Um, and I would strongly urge anyone that was in that situation where a parent isn't paying not to get into the trap of sort of linking that with the ability to spend time with the children because the right of the, the, the time and the relationship, that right really is the child's right. Um, and it's for the child to have the benefit of a good relationship with both their parents. And so it's almost a double whammy if you're saying, oh, well, you're not paying. And therefore, I'm not going to let the child see you. Um, you're almost hurting the child twice. Um, there are some good enforcement measures that can be taken with child maintenance. Um, so if it's through the child maintenance service, they can take it from source, from income. They can take it straight out of bank accounts. There's all sorts of things that can happen to enforce that. So if people do find themselves in that situation. Um, there are some really good, useful things that can be done to rectify it. Um, of course, if you're the parent paying, um, it goes without saying that you have an obligation. Um, unless there is a question over the parentage, um, it's pretty well established in law that you have an obligation financially towards, towards the children. Um, you've simply got to pay. Well, that's wonderful. And I'm kind of thinking, sorry, sorry Tom, I know it's usually you you're asking all you're the roll. questions that I'm going with me today. <laughs> <laughs> is it a myth that only men pay child? maintenance no, again it's completely gender neutral um so the, the the concepts in law it depends who the children are living with predominantly um so that could be mum or dad um and what's classed as the non-resident parent of the night um they are the one that has to pay um, and that could be mother or father so again it's it doesn't matter um it, it's very much specific to the circumstances rather than any sort of gender or sex that sort of scenario yeah i noticed when we were thinking about this that there was uh, when Faye and i were talking about a lot of the myths are they usually tend to be from one side don't they that, that, that there is a usually like a this unspoken gender bias that people assume don't they mm -hmm. that's one of the things that i loved about, about trying to do this topic today and there's another one that always comes up is that mum always gets the family home as well myth or fact myth um i mean i think in terms of I suppose the general point, the, the gender in, in family law, uh, gender bias in family law, it's something that's rumbled on throughout the entire of my career, so, and, and I'm sure it went on much longer before that. Um, it, it is a myth, generally, that there's any gender bias, but I think sort of what I was saying before about society, um, I think there's still question marks as to whether there are some gender bias in society. I mean, yeah. traditionally, when people talk about um, a slightly more traditional marriage of a breadwinner and of a homemaker, people generally still assume the breadwinner is the male party um, and homemaker is the female party. Now that's, 
a complete nonsense. So again, there's nothing in law that says that that's how it is or that it impacts in any way. But I think there is that inherent bias. And I think that the reality is it does still impact some decisions. Um, I think that sometimes uh, a father in relation to proceedings regarding children isn't necessarily always treated the same way as if that was a mother in that role. Um, so particularly if a father is used to being the primary carer, is there an automatic sort of, okay, children are going to be with father because he's primary carer. Um, perhaps not in quite the same way as, as if that was the mother. On the flip side of that with the finances, um, I think there's arguably more of a, a pressure, if you like, or more of an expectation that, that a husband will be paying um, maintenance than, than a wife would, um, even if those sort of respective financial positions were reversed um, in sort of the traditional sense. So whilst there shouldn't be any gender bias, there sometimes is. Um, going to your specific question about the family home, um, I suppose that sort of feeds into that because again, no, there, there isn't any sort of presumption or any, any suggestion that if it's the mother or, or the father or the wife or the husband, um, does it make any difference? It doesn't make any difference at all. Um, but I suppose again that sort of societal bias if there are children involved particularly if there are young children arguably there is a bit of a more of an expectation that they're going to be with the mother that need then needs to be met um, the sort of i suppose desire to keep stability for the children in the family home arguably it's more likely that the the mother's then going to stay in the family home so very fact specific so there, there isn't a sort of one size fits all um, but I, I do think there is perhaps anecdotally more chance of, of it being the mother that, that keeps the family at home or the wife that keeps the family at home um, and again I suppose the question to throw back to the two of you I think from my experiences um, I kind of get the impression that, that men are perhaps less emotionally attached sometimes to the family home than, than women can be um, I don't know what the two of you think in, in terms of that uh well i don't from my perspective it, it can it, it literally can be six of one half a dozen of the other um everybody's so unique and and so different and you you, you know that you'll get this from the client base that you work with no one situation is the same whilst maybe the reasons behind it um might be similar um the way that we all react and respond to those situations is always very very different um so again it can it, it really can be um, like I say, six of one, half a dozen, half a dozen of the other. Um, I don't know about you, Faye, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it, it's strange because I left my family home after both marriage breakdowns, uh, which was the best thing that ever happened to me to start fresh, somewhere new that I could put my stamp on. So I do, I agree, depending what, how in each individual heals, how they want to move forward. You know, sometimes it takes time and maybe even after a few years of staying in the family home, people then are ready to, to move on. And, and, it's, and it's strange, Paul, that you talked about expectations of what people feel that they want and need, because I think probably a lot of the myths come from the expectations of people. You know, it's kind of like that myth, maybe it's not a myth, that men usually keep hold of their pensions. Uh, is that born from expectation? What do you think about that, Paul? Is that a myth? Um, yes, again, it's a myth. Um, but I think like some of these things as we're sort of exploring these, uh, I think my view is, although they are myths on paper, um, in reality is there perhaps some element of truth behind it because people have this kind of inbuilt expectations as, as you rightly say and I think that's again true perhaps with pensions I mean I and again it's very it's very stereotypical but you do quite often get a situation where the expectation if you're writing a sort of exam question on, on a family law scenario is the stereotypical thing is the, the the husband has gone out and he's been the main breadwinner the wife perhaps has had some career sacrifice because she's been caring for the family and raising the family. Um, and in those circumstances, husband has the greater pensions because he's built up the income in the pensions. And as we mentioned before, perhaps the wife is then wanting to keep the family home because maybe she still has care of the children predominantly um, and they need to be housed and so on. And quite often then there's looking at offsetting the pension um, claim and, and therefore the husband seeking to retain more of the pensions. Um, it is all a myth. I mean, it, it, the reality is all of it is, is treated in the same way. So financial individuals, you should be looking at houses, you should be looking at other assets, you should be looking at pensions, all in their entirety. And yes, whilst you can trade 
trade them off. Um, none of that's to do with gender. None of that's to do with um, sort of who played what role in the marriage or anything like that. It's all about fairness. Um, so yeah, I think there's, it's definitely a myth, but I do think that the expectation, um, and funnily enough, I get it both ways. I mean, I get male clients coming to me with the expectation that, no, that's my pension, I should be entitled to retain it. Um, I do get that with female clients as well, who perhaps have the higher pensions. So I'm not sure there's necessarily a, a gender difference there. But I do also get it where people come and say, oh, no, they are their pensions. I don't want to touch their pensions because that's what they've built up by working very, very hard. And sometimes it's a very sort of odd conversation to be having with people saying, no, this is all part of the sort of fruits of the marriage. This all needs to be, be looked at quite carefully. Um, so, yeah, I think with, with all these things, that they are myths. But are, are, is there some merit in, in the set? Because people have that, again, as a sort of preconception. Um, and until that myth's dispelled, hopefully, which this might help too. Which we don't, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult because people do come with that kind of in built in um, and you almost have to do the work of, of unpicking it and saying no this is why actually that's probably not a fair approach yeah. i think with all of these as this is the kind of common theme that runs through is that from a legal factual perspective that there is no biases and there's there's a lot of myths here um but yet, as you keep saying, and I think you're absolutely bang on, uh, correct there, is that from a societal realistic perspective of experience, maybe, um, uh, and let's say divorces of yonder, year, uh, yonder years, that there has been experiences or, or certain expectations. But again, that's again part of dispelling a myth is actually that it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Mm. Um, and I think just kind of keeping on that thread around the, 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 the house part, and the, uh, the pension part. Um, this is one that I've seen a few times. Um, if the spouse had an affair, that I'm entitled to more. Absolute myth. Um, so whilst one of the factors that the court can consider in determining finance on divorce is conduct, um, that conduct doesn't include things like affairs, um, doesn't even really include behaviour in the marriage unless it's very, very extreme. Um, it's more to do with conduct such as if one party's committed fraud or gambled money away or things like that. So financial misconduct um, that comes into it. So the behaviour, so whether someone's had an affair or not, again, legally, absolutely no impact whatsoever on finances. So complete myth. Yeah. Psychologically, arguably might not be a complete myth because, again, I suppose you do get people coming in where... If it's the person that's had the affair, they might feel very guilty and therefore they are willing to concede and compromise more than perhaps they ought to for, for true fairness. Um, and vice versa, the, the, the betrayed party um, is perhaps clouded sometimes by that um, and the fact that they see that the marriage is broken down in their eyes for that specific reason and therefore they want to want of a better word, punish that person um, and get some sort of retribution financially. Um, so again, it's, it is a myth, but when you're trying to work out the outcome of the, the divorce and trying to reach a settlement with that, um, you do have to be alert to that dynamic and people do have that psych psychological uh, bias again, I think, in, in those sort of situations. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And you're absolutely right. And the example that you gave there is one that I know that I can, from personal experience, um, tick that box um where actually it was the guilt side of things and I, like you exactly like you say that you actually kind of maybe a bit of self-cleansing of well you have a bit you, you have more um or whatever it might be from a financial perspective around self uh, attributions but so um, i suppose when you get those situations what sort of things would you two be saying to your clients to sort of try and Get them to think a bit longer term i suppose because i think i quite often get that where people are in the heat of the moment and it's all still quite raw and whilst i'm trying to slow it down and sort of say right you've got to think how's this going to look in, in five ten years or whatever else what, what sort of things would you be doing with people in those situations let you, i'll let you go first Ben. <laughs> <laughs> again it, it varies from client to client and i think you know when you're dealing with a client that, that they're full of emotion whether that's the hurt the anger it's kind of supporting them through that healing process of, of trying to acknowledge their emotions and being that empathetic witness to, to what they've been through, but also trying to get them to say, well, this is how you feel, but actually what do we need to take into account? It needs to be fair. 
you know, mm. if they've got children, those children need to come first, not to use children as a weapon or as an excuse. Mm. And it's just helping the clients just to, to, to bracket those, those feelings in order to get the best outcome for, for everybody involved and not to what we call play the blame game. Um, because there is always a lot of hurt emotions, you know, when divorced, regardless of what mm -hmm. happened, how it happened, whether there was a fair of adultery, whether there was abuse, you know, there's always a lot to work with. And that, you know, I'm sure Tom's the same as me. It has to be done compassionately. It has to be done sensitively, sensitively. Um, yeah. And I suppose when, you know, the myth that men and women grieve differently, um, I think it is a myth, you know, everyone deals with it in their own way. I kind of wonder, I'm just going to ask you, Tom, maybe men and women process it differently. Potentially, yeah. Um, but again, that, that can all be part of that's all part of their own makeup, their upbringing, their belief system, their values, how they how they view the world, uh, and things like that. I mean, going to back to answer your question from my perspective, Paul, what I do similarly to Faye, it was you touched on a good point there around the aggrieved party, maybe where it's something that's happened to them as well. Um, depending on which client I'm working with, sometimes it's also helping them understand well let's say let's just use an affair as an example that's not necessarily the catalyst that's that's the end product of a wider problem whether that be a communications one a connection one within the relationship and it's helping the clients to understand well and again not associating blame but understanding cause and effect what part what role did i play that led to the events and actually then like you say then taking it further forward about the future outcomes of how that's going to impact the children if one party's got 90% of all the assets in the family home, etc., and the other parent is on the wrong side of town in a small bed sit sort of thing. Um, but likewise, I have had that with clients before where I've had some clients similar to myself who have said, well, I have, I, I've, I've continued always earned three, four, five plus times the amount my partner did, and I can continue to do so. So actually, it's not even necessarily about the guilt thing, but actually maybe they just want to do the right thing by helping their former spouse set up in the right way and that they can rebuild quicker. So again, it's all circumstantial and, and, and for each individual situation. Um, but yeah, I think that it's about helping them understand that emotion, like they said, where it really comes from, what the root cause is. And well, so if you've got if someone's angry about, let's say, being the, uh, the aggrieved party, well, then it's kind of getting deeper into the, the emotional psychology of that, of how it's impacting them. So whilst it might be anger, well, what type of anger? Where's it coming from? Are they feeling betrayed? Are they feeling inferior? Are they feeling weak? Like, because then you can actually help them to understand what the emotion is, so how they can work through it and kick in the, the, the logical frontal lobe of how things might be. And again, where, where children are involved, I know you've heard me say this a million times, right? um, but I always say to people that have got children, don't worry about it. Don't, don't bother thinking about co-parenting right now. Let's go 10, 15, 20 years down the line. How do you want a co-grandparent? How do you yeah. want it to be in 20 years time when you've got adult children who have grandchildren who are now deciding who's coming to which one's birthday party and this sort of stuff? And how do you want that experience to have been for them? Um, so that's where, where I was kind of go back to is about, I suppose it's the, um, let's say the divorce finish line where the decree absolutes through and the financial settlement's been signed. Everybody, when you're in the thick of it, is and I was the same, I was no different. I was thinking, right, you get to that date, you get to that date, we've got a decision, and you go, Oh, right, we're finished. It's just the beginning, it's just the start, especially obviously we where children are involved. Um, in fact, actually, that brings me to we, we're talking about the blame game side of things. So again, let's go back to our dispelling myths. Does someone have to be, does a party have to be blamed, or do we need to associate blame in order to divorce? Um, I'm glad you raised it. I mean, it's it's very topical. Uh, I think the I thought it might current happen. law, the current law, I suppose, um, which is changing, which I'll, I'll come on to in a moment. But technically, no. So if you still have the current law, you don't necessarily have to blame someone. So there is there's five facts that can be relied on at the moment to prove the irretrievable breakdown of the marriage, which is what you need to prove in order to get a divorce. Um, now, two of those are separation so either two years separation with consent or five years separation you don't need consent so technically with those two facts you don't actually have to blame the other party you can just say we've separated the difficulty with that of course is you've got to have been separated for at least two years and both people agree 
four or five years without agreement. So it's it's quite a burden, I suppose, um, in terms of that. If you can't use one of those, then yes, you will need to blame. Um, you will have to use blame or apportion blame in theory in a, in a divorce petition in order to progress a petition. I think it's become very clouded. I think the law, particularly on unreasonable behaviour as, as a fact for, for proving divorce, has become a bit of a muddied waters with famous cases that were well publicised where husband and wife were going to the Supreme Court arguing over whether it was unreasonable behaviour. Complete nonsense, complete waste of time and money. But thankfully, because of those things having happened and it becoming almost too too impossible to ignore how, how stupid they were being, um, they have now obviously changed the law. Um, the law is changing in April next year. And we have what's really captioned no fault divorce. So we are ending the blame game is the kind of tagline. And we are moving to a very straightforward system where in order to, to prove the irretrievable breakdown of the marriage, which is still what needs to be proven, um, you just need either one or both parties to submit a statement saying that the marriage is broken down. As far as I'm concerned, it's broken down and therefore I'm, I don't want to be part of it anymore. Um, and you will then be able to progress a divorce. So it will move things forward light years, I would suggest, um, in terms of family law, because again, my role, whether it's as a mediator or a solicitor, at the very outset when you're giving information and you're talking through all these things that need to be resolved, one of which, of course, is the legal relationship of the marriage needs to be addressed um, with a divorce. And then you start talking about how we can do that. And very often it is unreasonable behaviour that is, is the most likely um, fact that's used. And you're saying, well, OK, we need to show that it's been intolerable for you to continue to live with, with one another. It's intolerable to continue the marriage. You have to make allegations of behaviour. We probably need, say, five allegations. They need to be strong enough that they're going to be held up by a court to, to show that the marriage should break down. And suddenly you're getting all these things. And, and some people go great and they give you a whole raft of stuff and they sort of vent their spleen almost and, and give you loads of stuff some people sort of like oh i'm not really sure i want to do this but I, how, how do i kind of go about this um very difficult dynamic to then say okay we've got that up and running um now let's try and amicably try and sort out what we're going to do with the kids what we're going to do with the, the finances it just sets things up in such a yeah. terrible way um so hopefully it will present a real opportunity i think for, for family law to to move forward hugely um, in this country uh, and to sort of start looking at how we tackle these situations in a much less confrontational a much more constructive manner which i mean for me can only be a great thing that's exactly how i want to practice family law um yeah i think got to think about the, the wider dynamics um, and i think that it's, it's the only way we can go with it really yeah no because i've found that with clients and it's been great to be able to start helping clients understand that how important is it for you to go through a process of associate essentially associating blame not with saying um to go through that process now or to be able to wait not for october now so wait six months um as opposed to two or five years um to really go through the no fault reverse process because i suppose that the, the the myth part for me was do the reasons in the grander scheme of things, once the process of a divorce is finalised, the solicitor's are all, the job has been done and all the paperwork's through, for those individuals, and particularly if they are parents and their children involved, do the reasons necessarily matter in the grand scheme of things? No, and I think, I mean, generally speaking, I mean, the, the issue of what those reasons are, it can get very controversial, it can get very sort of difficult in that moment. But once it's progressed through that stage and the court kind of ticks the box and says, OK, fine, you can have a divorce. Yeah. Very, very rarely does it matter. Um, now, there are some circumstances where things might be said that arguably people do want to, to take issue with. So if there's something that directly relates to the children or if someone's accused of a crime or something like that, then there may be um, an issue there. But even in those circumstances, the most common thing that people do is to say they don't agree with these these, these allegations um but i do agree there should be a divorce so i'm not going to defend the divorce so it's a complete nonsense um you then end up at the end of the process with a piece of paper what used to be a piece of paper now it's an electronic document um a, a decree absolute um and that just confirms that the marriage is dissolved it doesn't say doesn't say why doesn't say anything about those reasons or anything like that so yeah it's, it's always been a bit of a, a bit of a nonsense frankly um and there's been all sorts of issues with it because 
I mean, just recently I was talking to someone um, about the concept of adultery um, and how in same-sex marriages that that doesn't apply. Um, is that, again, is there sort of, is, is it discriminatory? Um, should it not be the same sort of reasons uh, and things like that? And that's because of the specific definition of adultery. So all of these kind of outdated concepts, uh, thankfully, it's all going to be simplified. It's all going to be much more, I like to say, grown up, frankly, <laughs> I think, um, <laughs> because people should be able to make those choices. Um, as adults, they are able to choose whether to get married. They should be able to choose whether to get divorced. They shouldn't have to try and justify it to someone else. They shouldn't have to convince someone that, that that's something that they should be allowed to do. It, it just seems a very strange concept to me still that that's, that's currently what the law is, albeit thankfully it's changing. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to maybe talk further about discrimination. Maybe that's another podcast we can do. <laughs> yeah, absolutely is. So if there's anybody watching this that wants to come and talk about it, we've, we've been wanting to do one like that for a little while. So um, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, no, you're absolutely right. And I was thinking there um, about uh, kind of different client experiences as well. And if I'm dealing with a client in the very early stages, either the pre-phase they're starting to think about they, do they want to make that decision of separating and divorcing or if they're in the early stages of planning and actually starting to get the wheels in motion is about and i always kind of use the analogy of you need to kind of think of it like a bit like an employment contract do the reasons of you leaving that employment once you've left make any difference as to why yeah. um and just trying to un uh, unattach the emotional level value to it and to put the business cap on to think of it in a, a process and a formulaic side of things because once that's through and they like say well not even on a piece of paper because it's electronic no one else is ever really going to see it again um and it kind of becomes yeah. relevant. i think that's a great analogy actually i really like the sort of the reasons why you left your job or the reasons why you left a house or whatever you, you don't really reflect on them in, in due course so it, it's it's something that people need to try and look forward rather than look back um, because i think the things that need to be sorted out are all about the future they're not actually about the past um, I appreciate that some of the emotional side of it, maybe that's that's better to look back and sort of understand why things happen so that things can be, be adjusted and, and people can be hopefully happier going forward. Um, but certainly from a legal perspective, going back and trawling through what did or didn't happen on a cold Tuesday in November last year or whatever it was, it doesn't matter um, because it's all about what's going to happen with the kids, what's going to happen with the finances, how is everyone going to move forward and produce their foundation going forward. But but no, I, I always say that people, when they're in that very early stage, uh, I think the best thing to do is, is to seek support, um, whether it's seeking people like yourselves and going and getting some information and some sort of guidance in terms of helping with that decision process, um, whether it's taking legal advice so you understand what these sort of things might mean, um, whatever it may be, I think talking to people is, is always the best thing to do. Um, just going back to a point I just thought about when I was talking about the, the law changing, um, you sort of mentioned about waiting six months and, and then doing it in, in that situation. I think, again, that's a, a classic one where people should take advice because for some people, yes, it's going to make a lot of sense to wait because you're going to get things off on a better footing. You might even have had the risk of a defended divorce and you can essentially do away with that. Um, so waiting might be better because it might be more straightforward. However, there will be some people where that could be really prejudicial um, because things like tax consequences, if you separate in the same tax year and then transfer assets in that tax year, you don't necessarily have to pay capital gains tax. Um, whereas if you do it in the tax year after, you might have to have a tax liability. And obviously April coming is the next tax year. So if you've separated now and you're thinking of doing things and sorting things out, if you wait just because of this no fault divorce coming in, where, as I've already said, you end up with the same piece of paper regardless. Um, actually, you might have some unintended consequences that you didn't realise, um, and it could be financially quite costly um, if, there's, if there's CDT liabilities. Um, so again, it comes back to that point of if you're thinking of these things, if you're thinking of going down these routes, uh, it's better to take advice as early as possible, um, because otherwise there may be things that people just get blindsided by. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I've got just kind of one burning question, you know, talking about how a lot of, you know, divorces are done online and online documents. Is it a myth that online divorces are not legal? Um, is it a myth that online divorces are not legal? I've not come across that one. Um, <laughs> but yes, that's absolutely a myth. Um, 
I mean, the, the online divorce concept um, has, has really grown quite rapidly. And it's now actually the case that you can only petition for a divorce online. Um, so whether you are doing it yourself or whether you're using a solicitor, you'll still use the, the court's portal um, in order to submit those papers and to deal with the, the process of the divorce itself. So absolutely a myth because it's the only way legally of doing it now. So um, yeah, they are they are definitely legal. Um, I think more and more will go online. I mean, obviously with the, the pandemic, I think we've been doing all sorts of stuff um, online that we wouldn't have been doing before. So court hearings and, and various things like that as well. But, but yeah, definitely a myth that one. <laughs> yeah, I suppose well, on closing then um, and think about it, and taking that thread, I suppose it's like the quick divorce, the quickie divorce of using that online example, but also those processes that have been out there. And I see there was one in the news last week, wasn't there, where I'm not going to mention them, um, no free advertising for them. Um, but there was one in the news last week where they had some 20 plus, I think it was, cases thrown out um, because yeah. they essentially copied and pasted the same um reasons and just populated yep. the same thing for the same people um and again so from that perspective is that worthwhile yeah, think, is there a quick divorce i, I think there's, there's two issues there i mean the 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 organization where they literally just copied and pasted i think it was 23 divorce petitions that were identical just with different names on them um, and different addresses and so on um that's Again, I suppose a, a classic example of why the current law is not great because people are almost abusing the process in any event um, and putting the same things regardless. It, it's just doing something to tick the box. Um, clearly, that's not what they should be doing. And the reason those divorce petitions got thrown out is because it was spotted that that firm was obviously doing it that way and they really shouldn't be doing that. Um, the, the reasons being given, it's a court document. You can't just make it up. You've got to make sure that you are putting something that is, is true and relevant to, to that specific marriage where you're, you're seeking a divorce. All of that will thankfully, again, change come April. Um, the question of a quickie divorce, again, a bit of a bugbear for me. So there is no such thing as a quickie divorce. Um, divorces will move at the same pace, regardless of whether you are a list of celebrity um, or, or J blogs um, in the street. The, the law is exactly the same, the process is exactly the same. Um, it, it's just a complete nonsense. Um, I mean, in terms of how long that process takes, it's the same for everyone. Um, so people referring to quickie divorce, I suppose the sometimes the wealthier you are, the quicker you can sort things out because you can use the Rolls Royce processes, you can get all your lawyers in a room and thrash it out in one day, spending a huge amount of money um, to get everyone doing it very, very quickly. Um, or you can get arbitration or all these sorts of things. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so you might be able to sort finances, sort the children issues out quicker, and therefore you can finalize the divorce much quicker. Whereas perhaps the average people perhaps might not be doing that. They might be having to delay the divorce being completely finalized until finances are resolved, which can take a bit of time and so on. But, but no, quickie divorce, absolute myth. Um, and again, one that I read regularly in, in sort of tabloids and things like that. Um, and there is just no such thing. Um, it, it's just, a, I think, a way of trying to sell the news. I think, <laughs> <laughs> so. cool. there is. Faye, any more questions from you? I haven't. It's been totally, totally fascinating. And I hope it has cleared up some myths for our our listeners, especially if they're contemplating going through the divorce process. So it's been great to have you on, Paul. Have you got any more, Tom? I, I probably could keep going for about another <laughs> two or three hours, um, in all honesty. And I know we've spoken a lot about divorces today, so I think there was I was going to ask you some around. Um, actually, I will anyway. If you could explain what common law marriage is and, of course, the common myths that come with that. Um, common law marriage itself is a myth. Um, there is no such thing as common law marriage. So if you are not married, you are not married. If you are married, you are married. Um, and you should hopefully know <laughs> one way or the other. Um, so common law marriage, the myth of that is that some people have this concept that if you've been together long enough or if you've done certain things in an unmarried relationship, that you acquire the same rights as if you were married. Um, you simply don't. Um, and it's, it's quite a dangerous myth because I think, and again, this would be a whole another whole podcast talking about unmarried couples. Um, 
but if you're not married the the law is quite complicated and the rights and things that go with that particularly around home ownership um, and financial rights and things like that it, it's very difficult and i think there's potentially this whole raft of people that are relying on this common law marriage thinking that oh it doesn't matter that the house isn't in joint names it doesn't matter that it's in their sole name because we've got this common law marriage you don't um, and there are people that could be really, really badly exposed if that relationship breaks down, financially exposed. Um, and so I think, again, it's something that spread the message as wide and as loud as you can that common law marriage, it, it's a nonsense. There is no such thing. Um, and if people are in that sort of situation, they should be taking advice. They should be thinking about cohabitation agreements. They should be making sure that things are set up properly yeah, um, yeah. so that they don't end up in. And, so, and I've seen some very tragic circumstances where people have come across my door thinking that they're entitled to xyz or, or they're, they're going to get a fair share and they simply don't because the law isn't there yeah i think you're right though i think there's going to be a whole separate individual podcast just on 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 that one topic and i think the thing that's kind of springs to mind is where you look at percentages isn't you and the divorce rates that are increasing but of course marriages are in decline so there's kind of a double-edged sword there of yep. this huge raft of people and modern day relationships modern day families modern day society and how we all live very differently than we did 10 20 or even more decades ago uh, so yeah i think we definitely need to do one on a uh, on common law marriage or the fact of that it isn't a thing um <laughs> yeah. well, and what, what it is i think is important as well and making sure that people understand what that situation means legally um if you're not married and all the things that people need to be thinking about i, I would agree i think that there's a again far far too much to talk about than, than we've got time for now but i think that that's something where as you say, Tom, a, a lot of people are in that situation now. Um, and uh, it, it scares me, genuinely scares me how many people, when that relationship breaks down, either just don't realise and do nothing, or when they do realise and they come to me and they sort of say, oh, we weren't married, house was in his or her name, um, all the finances are set up in their, their name, everything's in their name. But surely I get something. And you're sort of saying, no um and it, it is devastating i mean i can remember having clients in floods of tears and realizing that they've set their whole lives up and some of these relationships have been 20 25 year relationships they've had children that have grown up and, and all these things and you just think this is horrendous um and so i think people in those situations they really do need to think quite carefully about about the situations that they're getting themselves into yeah absolutely Cool. Well, I'll be honest with you, I could sit here and talk to you all day, Paul. Um, in fact, we've done that several times before, haven't we, mate? Um, <laughs> but no, look, thank you so much for, for coming on. Uh, you've dispelled so many uh, myths. And uh, I, like I said, for anybody out there uh, listening this uh, or, or watching this, go, if you still have any more questions, come and ask me and Faye, pose them to us. We'll put them out to Paul and so on and so forth. And we'll channel them through or just put one in the comments when we post this out on the, across all social medias, because there are many, many myths out there that still need dispelling, um, but we don't have all the time <laughs> to do it today. Uh, but no, absolutely, it was brilliant having you. Thank you so much. Um, really useful uh, amount of information there for everybody and um, something that everyone can relate to and really understand. We've all heard those, my mate said this, or I've heard that, or so-and-so did this, and that's what they, that's how their divorce went. And it's just about sharing that knowledge with people. So thank you very much for coming today, Paul. Really appreciate oh, yeah. it. Thank you, Paul. I'm <laughs> sure there's a book there that you could write about <laughs> selling myths around divorce. <laughs> there may well be, but I, I, to echo what Tom said, I think if anyone is listening and they, they just want to check whether it's a myth or it's a reality, um, I think, yeah, by all means, post comments and, and you guys can either get it to me or, or contact me directly, whatever it may be, because I think some of these myths are genuinely dangerous, uh, I think. So it's it's good to try and dispel some. So, so thank you. No Lovely. Well, thanks again, Paul. And uh, yes, we'll be back with another episode uh, in a couple of weeks, won't we, Faye? And um, I think we've actually even just had about four or five suggestions from you today, Paul. So no doubt you'll be back <laughs> talking to us again very soon. Uh, no, thanks again, everyone. And um, yeah, if you do have any questions, do comment or drop them straight through to myself or Faye, and uh, we'll put you in touch with Paul. So thanks for coming. I'll see you.